Photography makes up the world around us. We live in a visual culture that's made up of billions of photographs. This makes reading and interpreting photos a vital part of understanding the world. But this isn't always easy or simple to do. Photography has a long and complex history with the truth. No matter how much we may logically know that photographs can be manipulated, as humans, our brains are very persuaded by visual evidence. My name is Ashley from the Gwinnett County Public Library, and today I'm going to talk about how photographs can tell lies. A good photograph is about knowing where to stand. Is this what I sound like? I don't know. Part 1. Context Context is everything that surrounds a piece of information and frames the meaning and interpretation of that piece of information. This includes the who, what, where, when, why, how surrounding a photograph. Altering or removing the context can change the meaning of a photograph. Change the context, change its meaning. Let's examine this with this example by Dwayne Michaels in 1973. Is this photograph true? simple picture of a bathroom. Now, we know it's a picture of a miniature bathroom with a leg inside of it. <laughs> now it's a man standing inside of a miniature bathroom in what looks like a storefront window. Now that picture is printed in a book that's being held by a person who's walking down an alleyway that is actually a printed framed photograph that was inside the original picture. So, what does a series of images tell us? It's the context that the images are put into that reveal how true or false they are. Context was being added when we were looking through the series of images, and context is created in many different ways. First, by the photographer themselves. The world is the larger context that every potential photograph exists within. By framing a part of the world through a photograph, the elements of context surrounding the photograph are lost when the frame is selected, like a crop of the world. Like in this example by Champu Baritone, She's bringing attention to the inherent ability that photography has to lie because we assume it's proof visual evidence. By showing how easy it is to remove context from a situation and control the intention of the image. Hashtag Thailand, hashtag chill out, hashtag alone. While we know this is possible, visual evidence is still super compelling. And I would probably still look at that frame on Instagram and think what an amazing time she's having relaxing on that quiet beach. Which brings us to another way photographs lie. Part two, people make them, people view them. So a photograph is just as able to lie as the person who created it is able to lie. And the personal bias of the person creating the photograph brings a subjective perspective to the photographs they create. Similarly, everyone who views photographs has various biases that change their interpretation of how they view and understand the image. So the bias and intention of the photographer is key when thinking about photographs, because a photograph is not just made by a machine, it's made by a person. People can manipulate situations just with their presence, with their personality. A person can pose a situation, move an object to a different position, or manipulate a situation to get a reaction. And most importantly, they decide what to include and what not to include in their frame. Here is a famous image by Diane Arbus that was taken in Central Park in 1962. This image was selected from this contact sheet. And this shows a bit of her process of interacting with the subject. How may viewing this change how we view the first image? The people, places, objects, they all exist and they're all basically the same. We are in Central Park in 1962. But how we view the situation and the subject does change from frame to frame. And what's changing is the intervention and intention of the photographer. 
Dionarbus wanted not just to make an image of this boy, but create an image about something with him as the subject. This boy's family probably would have taken an image similar to some of the other frames, but Dionarbus had an intention to create an image about the ongoing Vietnam War and the mental state of being surrounded by that violence. Notice that the boy is holding a toy grenade, and he has it in both images. But we can only really see what it is in the final image. The culture surrounding Dean Arbus's work during this time informed the intent of her images, and our understanding that that history was happening can help us read the image and understand it better. She intentionally didn't make an objective photograph, but really subconsciously, neither can any of us because everyone's surroundings and personal values and ideals affect how they see and frame the world. Here I will add that Diane Arbus was not a photojournalist. She was an artist, and her works are viewed in another type of context, museums and galleries. This means she doesn't have the same ethical responsibility to be documenting the truth because her images are art and are assumed to have artistic intention. Even still, it is very difficult, if not impossible, for a photojournalist's images to tell a 100% objective truth, as those images are also taken by people. As viewers, it's important to understand that a photographer is behind the camera, framing our view of the scene, and that photographs have context surrounding them as we assign our own meaning to the images we look at. This is explored in the work of photojournalist Ruben Salvadori and his series Photojournalism Behind the Scenes. He says, The project is an attempt to play with the creation and destruction of drama. He also notes that cameras do not pass unnoticed and that a group of photographers with equipment and gas masks can influence or even instigate the actions that they're there to document. The other photojournalists have been angry about this series because, he says, it breaks the unsaid covenant of the invisible photographer. This is all tied to something called the observer effect. This is actually a physics term that was discovered during a famous electron experiment that basically found that being observed made the electrons perform differently. This effect has since been applied to the idea of being photographed, and having cameras present, either through photojournalism, portraiture, camera phones, or surveillance cameras. So if a photograph can't tell the objective truth, what can we learn from photographs and what do they mean? I believe that they can tell a kind of subjective truth, like listening to someone tell a story. They can tell an interpretation of a person's experience. This places a large responsibility on photographers and those who publish and share images, which is to say all of us, to be aware of photography's power and to think about what is ethical to do and to say about photographs. Let's look at another example of personal bias. Photography has a long and successful history of creating social change through photojournalistic images that document a truth of something that needs to be fixed. While this usually creates a positive impact, It is still an example of revealing personal bias and is telling a subjective truth that the thing they are photographing is wrong. A famous historical example is Lewis Hines' Factory series, which created a photographic argument to end child labor and successfully used the photographs to reform labor laws in America. This has been true many times over the course of photo history, including Jacob Rees's housing reform, to Ansel Adams preserving thousands of acres of land of national parks with his landscape images, to Gordon Parks and Dorothea Lange and other FSA photographers helping with public programs during the New Deal. Collections of photographs to create a pointed visual argument has been successfully implemented time and time again. But there is another side to the coin where photography can be used to spread harmful misinformation or disinformation because of personal bias or for personal gain. Misinformation and disinformation are similar, but aren't exactly the same thing. 
Disinformation is distinctly different because the intent of the person or entity creating the lie is doing it on purpose to mislead the public and impact society to sway public opinion, usually to gain or keep power or to create chaos. The shareability of social media and the ease of manipulating photographs has increased the presence of disinformation. Misinformation is similar. It's the spreading of information that isn't true unknowingly. This includes misremembered information or when an innocent party spreads disinformation when they don't know it's not true. Let's go back to the child labor example. Inversely, let's say I have a personal bias in favor of child labor. I own the factory, and I don't want to end child labor. A lot of my machines have small parts that only tiny hands can fit into. Child labor is cheaper, which makes my products cheaper, and opens up a larger workforce than only adults. So I want to apply my bias to these photographs to spread disinformation that child labor is actually a good thing and creates a narrative that it's better for the children. So I reframe the Lewis Hine image with a Jacob Reese image that's about child homelessness around the same period to change its meaning. This is called a false equivalency meme. A false equivalence is a comparison between two or more subjects that's based in a kind of flawed or false reasoning. This is very often used in memes on social media to compare two images and in whataboutisms during debates to detract away from a certain topic. These types of memes are probably the most common manipulation of photographs that I see on social media and are very easy and quick to create in Photoshop. But a lot of times, they do tend to feel very true. Those children are smiling. There's some nice windows. It doesn't look overcrowded. Maybe they look a little messy, but employed. Imagine also if the factory owner had hired a photographer of their own to stage images where the children looked even more well-kept. We don't know if the children on the right are actually unemployed. Many homeless children of this time did perform child labor. But in this quick false equivalency meme, it doesn't matter what is true. It only matters what can be used to support a visual argument to seem true. That is emotionally harder to prove isn't true because there's visual evidence. And visual evidence is very persuasive, even if it's a lie. Part 3. The Staged Image The next way photographs can lie is by creating a staged image. This is one of the most common and oldest ways a photograph can lie. Since the invention of photography, they have been used a lot like painting to stage scenes. At photography's beginning, several inventors were simultaneously working on different methods. There was a big rivalry between two photography inventors in France, Daguerre and Bayard. Spoilers! Daguerre won because of his connections to the French government and because his invention was more evolved at the time. And Bayard did not take it well. He staged a scene of his own death and wrote an accompanying note explaining he had drowned himself because of the betrayal against his invention. With the sheets surrounding him and a note he wrote with the photograph, he's making a connection to the painting The Death of Marat. Through this, he also created one of the very first connections between the uses of photography and painting and their shared ability to create emotional and symbolic interpretations of the world and not just literal documents of it. So some staged photographs work like painting to create symbolic meaning or to tell a story, while others are staged to create a hoax or to create misinformation or disinformation usually for profit, power, or fame. Like the Cottingly Fairies, my favorite photography hoax. The Cottingly Fairies were captured by two young cousins, Elise Wright, who was 16, and Frances Griffiths, who was 9, in 1917 in England. The fairies first reached the public in a spiritualist magazine after a photo expert at the time said the images hadn't been manipulated, which is sort of true. The images hadn't been physically manipulated. They were staged with illustrations from a children's book. 
When the images appeared in the magazine, it caught the attention of spiritualist and author of Sherlock Holmes, Sir Arthur Conan Doyle, who loved the photographs and is the one responsible for really popularizing them as evidence of psychic phenomenon. For decades, the girls maintained that the photographs were real. These fairies are, like, totally real. Like, they're so real. So how do people believe things that are so silly? Well, in large part, it's because of something called confirmation bias, which is the human tendency to search out, interpret, and favor, and remember information in a way that confirms or supports what we want to believe or what we already value. People tend to unconsciously select information that supports their views, but ignore information that doesn't support or contradicts what they already believe. Similarly, we won't want to search out and find information that proves our beliefs aren't true. So Sir Conan Doyle wanted to believe the fairies existed, and when he saw a photograph that proved it, he used it as confirmation for something he already wanted to believe. Then I think there's something sort of in the middle, like a fib, in staging photographs, which is changing something small. Here is one of the first war photographs ever created, in what has become a very famous image of the Crimean War. But there are two versions of this photograph, one with less cannonballs in the frame and one with more. A lot of research has been done into these photographs that confirm that the image with more cannonballs was the second photograph taken, which indicates that the photographer moved them, probably to create a more dramatic image. Today's standards of ethics for photojournalism, this would be considered very unethical. But this is literally one of the very first war photographs, And there has been an evolution of what is ethical to do when photographing war. Before photography, the only way to document a war would be through writing, drawing, and painting. Moving cannonballs that were actually on site, that is, not brought from home to create a hoax and invent a false war, is comparatively accurate. But on the other hand, we assume it's 100% true because it's a literal document of the space, So it does have a greater burden to represent reality than a painting would in this context. So I think this example shows how easy it is to manipulate a scene, and depending on what and how much you change in the scene can affect how much the image is lying. Part 4. The Most Obvious Lie. Physical Manipulation. Physical manipulation is also as old as photography itself. The common belief is that modern photographs can be manipulated because of Photoshop, so historical images are more truthful because they couldn't be manipulated. But this is false. Photographs have always been able to be physically edited and manipulated. And just like modern times, many photographers use some kind of physical manipulation. One of the most famous historical examples is this photograph of Abraham Lincoln, which composites his face on the body of former Vice President John C. Calhoun. Historians believe that this composite was created after Lincoln's death because not enough heroic-looking images of him existed. Lincoln also had mostly images of his face, created so he could use them as campaign items when he was running for president, so he didn't have a lot of images of his full body. Another widespread historical example is spirit photography, which claims to capture images of ghosts and spirits. Spirit photography and the spiritualism movement met its rise in the aftermath of the Civil War in a grieving country that wanted to connect with its fallen dead. Photographers such as William Murmler and William Hope ran thriving businesses taking photographs of people with their supposed dead relatives. Both were shown to be frauds, likely creating the images through two exposures on a single plate, a technique that the average person at the time wouldn't have knowledge existed. But true believers, like our old friend Sir Arthur Conan Doyle, as well as the First Lady, Mary Todd Lincoln, refused to accept any proof that this was a hoax. Ooh, all people in the past with your ghost pictures. So silly, we'd never believe in such things today. Watch. 
Deep fakes. So while throughout all of photo history, there are many examples of photographs being physically manipulated, there is a modern difference in the advancement, ease, and accessibility of technology that's made manipulation very widespread and difficult to discern. In modern terms, this is called a deep fake. Deep fakes are synthetic media meaning that it's an invented, man-made type of media that didn't naturally exist. Deepfakes can take a person in an existing image or video and replace it with someone else's likeness, or can be animated to do or say anything. Deepfakes use powerful new techniques from machine learning and artificial intelligence to manipulate or generate images and audio with a high potential to deceive because it can look so real. Some deepfake technology has become so accessible you can download it in the App Store and anyone can use it and upload it to the internet. This is not my body. There are also shallow fakes and selective editing. These are more crude edits or tweaks to photographs or videos that aim to change something small, but by doing so, change the meaning. So, for example, did you know there was a subset in the suffragette movement that only protests for peace, and this often included not allowing women to vote for a greater good of unity? Just kidding, I made this sign in Photoshop. Selective editing also includes changing the color or contrast or adding a filter. Like in these examples of O.J. Simpson on the covers of Newsweek and Time during his murder trial. When the covers were placed side by side on newsstands, the public immediately noticed that Time's cover had darkened Simpson's skin. The selective edit changed the meaning and interpretation many had of the image. Basically, that OJ would look more like a murderer if his skin was darker. So what should we do? How do we combat this? If anyone can make up anything and create an alternative reality through deep and shallow fakes, how do we know what's true? Here is some information from the International Federation of Library Associations about spotting fake news. Consider the source. Click away from the story to investigate the site, its mission, and contact info. Make sure it's a legitimate site. Read beyond. Headlines can be outrageous in an effort to get clicks and make money, so what's the whole story? It also helps to combat this to consider how you feel when you see an image or read a headline. Did it make you feel a really intense emotion? Be wary of the source and fact check the information before you invest that that headline is reality. Check the author. Do a quick search of the author. Are they credible and are they even real? Supporting sources. Click on the source links to see if they're real. Determine if the information given actually supports the story that they're saying, or are they making a false equivalence. Check the date. Websites will sometimes post old news stories when they're not relevant to current events, but make them seem like they're related to current events. So check the date to make sure it's new. Is it a joke? If it's really outlandish, it might be satire, so research the site and the author to make sure it's not a joke, like The Onion. Check your biases. Consider if your own beliefs could affect your judgment and how you're reading the image or the article. Ask the experts. Ask a librarian or consult a fact-checking site. Fact-checking sites are really good resources for finding out if images or headlines are true. Here's a list of a couple of fact-checking sites that the Berkeley Library has put together. PolitiFact, factcheck.org, FlackCheck, opensecrets.org, FactCheck, Snopes, etc. Also notice that on these fact-check sites, it will have a spectrum of truth. If something is an outright lie or hoax and nothing about it is true, if something's been taken out of context for it to not make sense anymore, and things like that. 
If you're seeing, especially images, freshly on social media, they likely will be on the home page. Or you can search a short description of the image to have it show up and see if that image is true. Thank you for joining us for How Photographs Can Tell Lies. If you have questions about how to identify deep or shallow fakes, or want help evaluating how true a photograph is, come talk to your local librarian and use the fact check sites linked in the description to help. Goodbye.